looking at the use of staples in residential seismic retrofits. Before continuing, I think it's very important to know that this is not an academic topic. There's a very large earthquake coming to the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'd like to show you a little bit of information from the United States Geological Survey. This is a graph that shows the intervals between large earthquakes on the Hayward Fault. So right here, there's 155 years between the 1315 and the 1470 earthquake, 160 years between the 1470 and 1630 earthquake, etc. Now, as you can see, it's been 140 years since the last major earthquake in 1868. And when this uh, graph was made, uh, that was 11 years ago. So right now, we're at 151 years. So we've exceeded the 95-year mark, the 143-year mark, and we've almost reached the 155-year mark. So that should really warn us that, you know, look, in six years, we're going to be at the 160-year mark, which is the longest span of time between large earthquakes on the Hayward Fault. So so what does that have to do with staples? Well, as you see in the statistics here, it is expected after the big earthquake here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which we just saw is you know impending, that there will be $75 billion worth of damage to residences. And that's a lot of people's homes. And the amazing thing about staples is they have a lot of resistance to earthquakes if they are installed properly. And that is exactly what this video is all about. In seismic retrofit work, we use three types of fasteners. We use lag screws, we use nails, and we use staples. Now, there isn't much known about staples. At least you never hear about it. I've never seen a, a, a engineer give me a set of plans that had a staple cheer wall. I've never seen a detail that uses staples. If you talk to building inspectors about using structural staples, they have no idea what you're talking about. And this is very interesting because a staple will do practically everything that a lag screw will do or that a nail will do. Plus, it has some unique characteristics that a nail or a lag screw cannot do. So the staple is the most versatile uh, fastener that a seismic retrofit contractor can use. Many older homes along the west coast of the United States as well as Canada were built with something called a cripple wall that separates the house from the foundation. This is what they look like. So this is the foundation right here, and this is the floor of the house right here, and then this wall right here, that's called the cripple wall. Let me show you how and why they collapse. This first image here is a house where there's nothing going on at all. And then you come over here and you see how the ground is moving underneath the house where the foundation is. And when that happens, these two by four studs in the cripple wall, they start to lean. So you can see them leaning like that. And then as the ground continues to shake underneath the house, then the cripple wall studs start to really lean and the house is starting to, you know, practically come off the foundation and then finally when it keeps on going the house shakes you know for 10 15 seconds or something and then all of a sudden the house falls completely off the foundation and that's what a seismic retrofit is supposed to prevent and staples structural staples can go a long way in preventing that from happening here you can see two photographs of cripple wall damage. The one on the left is a complete cripple wall collapse. The one on the right is a partial cripple wall collapse. And let me show you how you can tell if you've had a complete cripple wall collapse. So this right here is the landing, this concrete landing right here. And you used to get onto this landing and then you would go into the front door of the house. You'd step up into the front door of the house. Now, as you can see right here, the floor is a few feet below the landing. So there's the top of the landing, and then this is the actual floor is right here. So it dropped down, I don't know, maybe a foot or two. And the reason it did that is because there was a wall right here. That was the cripple wall. And when the cripple wall collapsed, the house sunk down this, you know, one foot or so. And then, you know, the cripple wall has, you know, collapsed and the house has received significant amount of damage and the house can no longer be lived in. The image on the right, that is a partial cripple wall collapse. So you can see here is the foundation and these are the studs that are leaning. 
And the reason they're leaning, obviously, is because the floor rocked back and forth and the wall, the cripple wall, simply couldn't take that, uh, that movement. Now, it's interesting to note that cripple walls are braced with plywood. And this T111 siding is made out of plywood. And the reason it collapsed is because the plywood probably wasn't installed correctly. And in this video, we're going to learn one of the ways to install plywood correctly using staples. The biggest advantage of staples is the fact that staples do not split the framing. So oftentimes we must attach a plywood to framing that is, you know, very, very short blocks, which will tend to split at the ends, or the, the framing will be very old and brittle and it will split if it's, you know, nailed into. So anyway, there's big advantages to the fact that it just simply does not split the wood. Here, I'll show you one right here. So this is a typical cripple wall retrofit. And what they've done here is they put blocks on top of the mud sill. So here's a the old mud sill right here, which is a two by six, and they put a two by four on top of it. You can see the same thing here. They put a block here. It's usually 14 inches long. And then here's our mud sill right here. So this is one without blocks. And this is one with blocks. And what they've done now is they take this piece of plywood and they've nailed it uh, into the block, you know, probably every three inches, what's what most of the codes say, or every four inches. And so what will happen is if this nail goes right at the end of the block, it'll split it. And so let's say you put one nail right here, it splits it, then you come over here and you split another one. Or let's say you're nailing it and you, and you hit this, uh, you go right in the, you know, in the crack right there, that nail is not going to do any good. So um, those are all big problems is the, the end distances are very, very hard to maintain when you are using nails, whereas with staples, you can get within half an inch of the end of any block and you won't have any problems at all. So that's one of the big, big advantages of staples over nails in retrofit applications. Not only is it a problem where the plywood can split the blocks behind the plywood, but the blocks that the plywood is nailed to can also split. You see these nails right here? We got a nail here and we see two here. We're supposed to have four. And these nails definitely can split the wood. And so we're going to be looking at that connection very closely. The other big advantage is sometimes in a you know cripple wall retrofit, you know it'll have the, the foot the house will be 24 feet wide, but there's a porch there and there's gas meters there and there's you know obstructions there's pipes there's all sorts of things, and you can only get six linear feet of plywood. There's only six linear feet of foundation available to put a shear wall, and at that point you need the strongest shear wall you can possibly put in. And if you have to worry about splitting, you can't use nails. And so the best option in those cases, if you can get the capacity, you just make the strongest shear wall out of staples that you possibly can. You know, make sure that the load is dragged to it with however you have to do it. And then you can protect the entire front of a house with just a six foot long shear wall uh, without having to do a lot of foundation work, moving, you know, dealing with the porch and moving plumbing and gas heaters and all that sort of stuff. So that's another huge plus is you can get very, very high uh, capacity shear walls if they're made out of staples. And so we're going to be looking at both those things. We're going to be looking at the fact that the uh, staples do not split the wood and the fact that it looks like you can get some very, very high uh, capacity shear walls when you use staples. So just to review things, uh, cripple walls collapse because they're not reinforced and plywood is what reinforces them to keep them from collapsing. So right here again you see how the ground moved underneath the house and then the cripple wall collapsed and the house was severely damaged. Now here we have a cripple wall with nothing on it and earthquake comes it tries to knock it over and then a piece of plywood is all it takes to prevent that from happening and when you put the plywood on in bolts and things it's called a shear wall because they resist shear forces so part of a retrofit is to convert the cripple walls into shear walls and using staples is a very effective way to do that so here i want to look at this picture this photograph right here this is viewed from the outside. So this right in here behind all that plywood, that's a crawl space. And then this wall right here from here to here and here to here and here to here, that is the cripple wall. 
and there's plywood has been nailed from the inside to create a shear wall and you see this block right here there's a block right here and there's a block right here the plywood has been nailed to these blocks and the blocks have been attached to the mud seal and so that is the connection where staples can be used so here you can see there is the mud seal that's this green right here and this is a block and you see the four nails this is a block and there's four nails and so you would take this block and you would just put it over here put the nails down to nail it into the nailed into the mud sill and that would be how you make that connection and then once you do that you take your plywood and you nail it into the block so here you can see right here there's a block and the plywood is nailed into the block and then this darker piece right here is the mud sill so the way um, most in fact I would say all retrofit guidelines achieve this is by using the four nails that connection can be made with staples much more effectively and I'm going to show you uh, how that's done first I'd like to look at the different retrofit guidelines that have been published over the years and every single one of them recommends these four ten penny nails and I would say the reason for that is because the very very first guideline which was published I don't know the 70s maybe as early as, uh, as the 60s a long time ago and is currently part of the California existing building code recommended those four nails and it's kind of like law once someone you know does something is considered well a lot of people looked at that it was determined by you know a, a bunch of scientists and smart people that using the four nails was the way to go and then it would replicate itself and that's what's happened uh, up to now so that every single guideline uses those four nails and the staples are far superior the big problem is uh, nails that come in nail guns are all diamond tipped and diamond tipped nails do tend to split the block the diamond goes into the wood fiber and the deeper it goes it you know pushes the fibers apart and it can cause it to split it doesn't happen every single time but it does happen enough that it can seriously compromise a retrofit unless something's done about it now there's some guidelines that what they say is oh you know make sure and pre-drill before you put in the nails where the reality is that's not going to happen a contractor is not going to do that he's either going to leave the block or he's going to switch over to smaller nails which won't work from a you know from an engineering point of view um, a contractor he has to make a living and he needs to you know he needs to get the job done he wants to do it well but if a block splits you know he doesn't have a whole lot of incentive to take it out and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second this photograph comes from an online course offered by the Association of Bay Area Governments uh, teaching contractors and homeowners how to seismic retrofit a house now you can see where a pre-drilling would be effective here so you, what you would do is you would pre-drill the hole and then you would take your you know, your, ham your nail and you would put it in the hole and then you would drive it and you wouldn't have to worry about splitting but in the real world this is not done nail guns are used if you do it this way you'll never get out of there you know you're trying to make a living you're trying to get your job done as fast as you can and you want to do it well of course so this is completely uh, this is just not in touch with reality I, I believe that the people on these committees probably thought well there's a guy underneath there and he's got his you know he's got his hammer and he's his nails and you know and he's got his drill and he's gonna pre-drill it and you know a lot of times you can't even barely swing a hammer if you wanted to you've only got you know a total you know head clearances you know 12 inches or something so this is completely out of touch with reality this is not how the real world works this is not what seismic retrofit contractors do I'd like to explain to you a little bit about what it's like to remove a uh, block that has four ten penny nails in it now this is from ESR report 1539 as you can see it takes 26 pounds of uh, withdrawal force to remove a 148 nail uh, that has one inch of penetration in this case as a 10 penny uh, nail it'll have inch and a half penetration so when you multiply that out that's about 40 pounds uh, of force is needed to withdraw the nail and now that is the allowable value so you probably have to triple that if you want to get the actual value so you're looking at you know three or four hundred pounds of force that you have to exert on that block to remove it we only have ten two feet of uh, crawl space maybe you're on your belly or you're 
<clears throat> really cramped, and you're supposed to get a hammer out and a and a and a and a, um, and a you know a, a bar and try to pull it, pull it out. The incentive to leave it there is pretty big, and so you'll either switch to nails that are thinner for all your future nails, or you'll just go ahead and leave it there, and you might leave a whole bunch of them there because you know that you they they don't all split when you shoot them with a nail gun, but enough of them do to make it a problem. I would like to go into the anatomy of installing a block. A lot of times the access to the front of the house is in the back of the house, and most houses are about 50 feet long. So what a contractor has to do is he has to you know, go into the house, measure what the block sizes are. So he measures his blocks, and he takes his blocks, and he puts them in a tray, a busing tray normally, like you see in a restaurant. Then he puts his, uh, his, all of his tools, nail gun, you know, uh, lights, you know, all sorts of stuff. You got a, stuff in there. And then he has to drag it 50 feet to the front of the house. And a lot of times there's heating ducts he has to go underneath. And it takes a long time, to, you know, to get up there to put your block in. So then he'll install the block. And if it splits, then if he's conscientious, he has to do that all over again. He has to crawl on his hands and knees. So it takes a long time. Crawl on hands and knees all the way to the back, back of the house again. Get out, get a saw out, cut a block put it back in a tray and drag it all the way back under there again and install the block. So the incentive is not there to you know, remove the block. The incentive definitely is to go ahead and leave the block there and in the future use smaller nails. And generally what we see is uh, contractors will put in the smaller nails. Sometimes they'll only put in one or two blocks, uh, nails in the middle. We've seen, we've seen it all, but to do it right, the really the correct way to do it, in my opinion, would be to use staples. Contractors are trying to make a living. They can't be spending all this time going back and forth. They're gonna use nail guns. They're not gonna pre-drill everything. So this particular system with the nailed, nailed blocks is something I personally had a lot of experience with. And because I had this, you know, these experiences, I said, there has got to be another way and that led me to Staples, and I'm going to show you uh, how that led me to Staples by giving you some information that uh, I looked for. So as a result of my experiences, I started studying as much literature as I could find about shear wall construction. And I happened to find this in APA Research Report 138. APA, that stands for, stands for the American Plywood Association, who did lots and lots of tests on shear walls. And what I found is here where it says the use of pneumatically driven staples showed that staples with a 7 16 crown could be driven as close as one inch on center without causing splitting either at the time of driving or when the specimen was loaded in shear. Now that was great news for me because what it meant to me is if I can just find a staple, I can make that connection and not have to worry about it splitting. Well, now that I found the solution, I needed to find the staple. So what I just read said I need to find a 7 16 staple. And so I looked through a document called NER 272, and in it, it talks about, you know, the strength of different fasteners. And I found this particular table right here, and it said I'll need to have one inch of penetration, that these different uh, values here on the right-hand side are how much earthquake strength, you know, resistance they'll have. And over on the left, you'll see where the gauges of staples are. So I need to find one of those uh, gauge staples, either 14, 15, or 16 gauge staple that is two and a half inches long because it's got to go through the inch and a half two by four and in, down into the uh, mud cell. Now that I knew what size staples I needed, uh, I had to find a staple gun that would shoot those staples. So what I did is I called around to different manufacturers. And Senko, who makes a lot of nail guns and staple guns, happened to make a staple gun that would shoot exactly what I needed. So this here, this gun that you see, shoots a 15 gauge staple that's two and a half inches long and it has another benefit. It can be adjusted to a depth penetration. So you can also shoot staples into plywood. So you can actually make shear walls with staples using this particular gun. And as we'll see uh, shortly, you can put the staples really, really close together and not have to worry about splitting. So this was a godsend as far as preventing splitting in any seismic retrofit, both for framing and also for uh, shear wall construction.
And you can put in a ton of staples without worrying if the block is going to split. So here we have a 14 inch long block. That's what you normally work with in seismic retrofitting shear walls. And then we have 63 staples and it can resist 5,600 5, uh, pounds of lateral force, which is what earthquakes resist. So this, you know, this, all these staples can resist anything you want. You don't have to worry about splitting. It's an absolutely fabulous way of making uh, these types of connections. Staples also work quite well when we're using a system that the American Plywood Association calls the reverse block method. Let me show you how that works. So here we have our piece of plywood and then this is a 2x4. So what we've done here is we put the 2x4 next to the plywood and then we nail the piece of plywood to the back edge of the 2x4. Then we take that whole assembly and we put it down right here and then along here we either nail or we staple this 2x4 into the mud sill right here. So what you find in all these old houses is this will be a full 4 inches, this will be a full 6 inches, so you have 2 inches from the face of the stud to the edge of the mud sill. So here's a situation under a typical crawl space here in the San Francisco Bay Area where a reverse block method shear wall would be very effective. So here you can see that the mud sill, that is a full six inches. And this right here, this is the stud, and that's four inches. So we have two inches right here where we can put a, uh, a reverse block. Now notice that the bolts are inside the uh, stud cavities. So here we've got a bolt here and a bolt here and a bolt you know, back in here, which means when we put the, lay the two by four flat along the mud sill right here, uh, we don't have to worry about the bolts because they're right behind our reverse block shear wall. So this is a pretty effective way to build a retrofit shear wall and one that we use quite often. Now we need to see if the reverse block system will work from an engineering point of view. There's a document called the National Design Specification and it's part of the building code. And what it does is it tells us how far apart nails and staples can be from each other in order to maintain their effectiveness, how far from the edges of wood, how wood species impacts them, uh, how far from the edges. It tells us everything there is to know about you know, using staples and nails. And we need to know that to figure out whether or not this system is going to be effective. Now this uh, table right here that you see on the upper left, that has to do with nails. But a staple is simply a smaller nail. So here you'll see a 10 penny nail, and that is a 0.148 thousandth of an inch, and a staple is simply, a 15 gauge staple is simply half of that, a 0.27 inches. So basically, you know, uh, each leg of a staple is basically half of a nail. Um, just looking at the diameters. So let's go ahead and see what these are. So the edge distance right here, 2.5D, that stands for diameters. That means from the edge distance is from the edge of the 2x4 right here to the edge of the fastener. So it either the staple or the nail. So 2.5 diameters with a 10 penny nail is about 3 8 of an inch. With a staple, it's about 3 16 of an inch. Uh, those are the edge distances that we need to maintain. Now right here, you'll see the end distance. So this is end distance right here. And that means from the end of the two by four, and here's our end right here at the end. So here, right here, we can be 15 diameters. And that's, you know, about two and a quarter inches right here. And then it says right here that the spacing between fasteners in a row can also be 15 diameters, and that's about two and a quarter inches. So what it's saying here is we can put a, you know, nails here, we can go two and a quarter, 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 so long as we maintain the edge distances and the end distances that are here in the natural design specification. So this right here, we have to be really careful because this edge right here, which if you follow this yellow line, the edge of the mud sill is right below that. We have to worry about that edge as well. So the edge that is underneath this two by four, which is equivalent to that, we have to make sure that our nails are in our staples uh, maintain their edge distances from here, you know, from, from the edge of that uh, mud sill. 
So we have an inch and a half to work with. So if we're using a nail, we come here, we go three eighths of an inch from that edge. And you know what we would do where that yellow line is because that represents the edge of the mud still below it. We can also go three eighths of an inch from here. And then we can put nails right in the middle pretty much anywhere we want. Now with staples, we can go 3 16 of an inch from here on the edge, 3 16 of an inch from the edge of the mud sill, which again, it runs all the way down this way uh, underneath the yellow line. And if, so long as we keep those edge distances, we'll be in good shape. So right now we're going to be watching a technician install a reverse block shear wall with staple. <coughs> Good idea. This demonstration shows how amazing staples are. These staples here are half an inch to uh, one inch apart with absolutely no problem with splitting. Could have put them even closer than that. Staples, they just don't split wood. And it's uh, very, very handy. Right now we're gonna go ahead and put staples into the narrow face of the two by four and see how many staples we can get in there and how close they can be because that's where we can actually staple plywood to the framing. And we might be able to get some very, very high capacity shear walls in that way. <laughs> So here you can see staples that have been put a quarter of an inch to a half an inch apart. And as you can see, there have been no, no problems with uh, splitting. So the staples are really amazing when they go into the narrow face of a two by four. You can really do a lot. Now, maybe I just didn't know better. I mean, from what I read in all the tables at the American Plywood Association and so forth and other tests, the closest they'd ever done, I believe, was inch and a half or two inches. I just didn't know any better. But I went ahead and tried it anyway, and man, you can really get staples very, very close together. And I always wondered, how strong can you make a sure wall? This letter dates all the way back to, I believe, 2003 when I was on an International Code Council committee writing seismic retrofit guidelines for the San Francisco Bay Area. And as a committee member, I contacted the uh, American Plywood Association because they are the lead research facility for shear walls in the country. And I asked them to evaluate the four methods that we had developed uh, in my company. And so you can see here that the reverse block method is, uh, is highly you know, recommended, as is the stapled uh, blocking method if you happen to use uh, fasteners. In other words, if you're going to use fasteners, use staples uh, rather than nails. Now, unfortunately, the flush cut method, the saws are no longer available, so this is no longer a viable strategy. But I think this letter uh, lends good support to the case that I've been making here that a reverse block method with staples uh, is a very good alternative. In some situations, we must staple plywood directly to the subfloor, and this is a case in point right here. So the problem was that we could not access a mud sill. You can see right in here, maybe the concrete was all the way up to the floor, you know, whatever the reason is, but we could not access a mud sill to do, uh, use any conventional methods. So what we've done is we've taken this wood member right here, and we attach this piece of plywood to it. So what we did is we nailed it right, nailed the two together right here where that seam is. And then we bolted this wood member here and then here. And then we pushed that up against the floor and then we stapled it to attach the plywood to the uh, subfloor. This isn't something that we do uh, very often, but when you need to do it, it, this is the only way you can do it. So here is a construction detail that illustrates exactly what we saw in the photograph uh, just now. And in this particular situation, the problem was that the distance between the edge of the sill and the edge of the concrete exceeded two and a half inches. 
Now, the reason that's a problem is the standardized hardware called the Simpson URFP has a uh, maximum uh, edge distance of two and, a half, two and a half inches. So if we were less than two and a half inches, we could have used that hardware, but we can't in this situation. So that's why this particular detail was developed, because sometimes that happens. Now, it also would have uh, been the case, if, let's say that this mud sill was embedded in the concrete, and sometimes that happens. In other words, this mud sill, rather than being here, it would have been an embedded in the concrete right there. And in that case, the subfloor would have been sitting straight on top of the foundation, and there would be no access to the sill. And without this particular construction detail, uh, you would never be able to attach the floor to the foundation. When working with staples, it's very important to know if the wood is pressure treated or not. And let me show you why. This is a screw, and as you can see, the screw is completely disappeared. A little bit of it is left right here, but the pressure treated wood pretty much disintegrated the entire screw. And this is a very corrosive wood that's called ACQ. And then you come over here and you see the exact same thing. This is some uh, galvanized steel and it was up against some pressure treated wood. It did get some moisture and it caused you know, pretty much the disintegration of this, of this piece of steel. So it's a serious problem. Uh, this, these pressure treated woods are very corrosive and you gotta be very, very careful about using them. Now pressure treated wood often looks like this right here. You know, it's, it's brown or it's green and has these incisions. So you'll see these uh, marks here which is where they, uh, they cut into the wood when they applied the preservative. So they injected it into the wood through those, you know, through those incisions right there. So um, if you have any doubt whether or not a wood is pressure treated, uh, always be safe and use, use stainless steel staples. So as you can see right here from the International Building Code, which is also part of the California Building Code, staples shall be of stainless steel. So that's pretty clear. Uh, no matter what, if you're going to pressure treated wood, always use stainless steel staples. Right now we're going to look at some tests that were done previously. We're going to be looking at APA Research Report 154 and some testing that was done at the University of Utah in 2008. The American Plywood Association conducted some tests on staples shear walls and they are found in APA Research Report 154 Table 3 and we're going to be looking at that table right now. We're only going to be looking at the uh, tests that involve very, very close spacing of the staples because we want to see how much uh, capacity can we get out of a stapled shear wall. And this is important because sometimes in a seismic retrofit, you have very, very limited amount of wall to work with. So for example, let's say there's a house you're working on and you know it's 24 feet long, 18 uh, feet of that is taken up by the porch meaning there's, there's no foundation there, and the, there's only you know, six feet left, and you want to get as much capacity as you possibly can in that limited amount of uh, wall length. So that's why we're only going to be looking at the uh, closed spacings. So let's go ahead and see how you read this table. The first thing that we can learn is that this is going to be structural one plywood. That's a special type of plywood made for shear walls. And then this tells us that the staples are two inches apart on the outside edges, 12 inches apart everywhere else, and the length of the staple is inch and a half. So it's inch and a half long, and then the thickness of the plywood is half inch, number of tests is one, and then we come over here, and this is the ultimate load, 1,290. And what that means is that's the point at which the uh, test specimen completely failed. I mean, you would look at it and go, man, this thing is, you know, this thing is trash. It can't resist anything anymore. So that is a point of failure. Now, this number right here is called the allowable value. It's, you know, it's called target design shear, but it's another name is allowable value. And what that means is they say, well, you know what? If someone buys some plywood and it's defective and they don't install it quite correctly and the building inspector doesn't do what he's supposed to, do, you know, supposed to do, you know, if we just factor in all those may might go wrong things we can count on it to resist 480 pounds uh, per linear foot even though the test shows it's considerably more so that's what the allowable value is so that's the one we always look at now if we come over to this one even though it's a smaller number a 14 gauge staple is larger than a 16 gauge staple 
So in this case, the staple is an inch and a half uh, spacing. So these were two inches apart. These are inch and a half apart. These were the staples were 12 inches apart everywhere except on the edges. And this one is six inches. And this one is quite a bit different here because the staples were two and three quarters inches long. Uh, you know, that's a pretty long staple compared to the inch and a half. And then this plywood is actually thinner than the half inch. And then if we look over here at the, uh, at the you know, these are the two, the two tests. One test was for this ultimate load was this much, other tests were this much. The average was this much, that's uh, 3,666. And we know this very large number, 1,625. Now, what we need to look at is that footnote there. And the footnote says that this is for a double shear wall. In other words, there's the staple, you know, there's the, the structural one plywood is on one side and, and it's also on the other side, so it's a double. So to figure it out for one side, you have to divide that by two. And so this, uh, this configuration of staples and plywood can resist around 800 pounds per linear foot uh, compared to the 480 here. So let's look at the, what the things that were different here and that made it stronger. So the 3 8 you know, that certainly didn't make it stronger. You'd think it'd be the other way around, that the, the, the thinner the plywood, the weaker it would be. Now, this made a big difference, I believe, two and three quarters, because elsewhere in the test, it says that the failure of these, uh, of these shear walls was faster withdrawal. And so the deeper the staple in the framing, the harder it is to withdraw. So that's certainly gonna be one big factor. And then over here, we have the uh, staples were an uh, inch and a half apart instead of two. And that would also make a difference because naturally the, you know, the closer they are together, the more staples you have. And then, there, and then also that, uh, uh, that also increases withdrawal resistance simply because you have more staples. Another factor is the fact that the 14 gauge staple is you know, bigger than the 16 gauge staple. Then the other uh, staple we're going to look at is the 15 gauge staple. Now the 15 gauge staple in this case is in rated sheathing. Rated sheathing is a little bit weaker than uh, structural one. In this case, the staples are put three inches on the edges and six inches everywhere else. And the length of the staples, like the first test, are inch and a half. And then the thickness is half inch. And we come over here and we end up with an ultimate load of 1,305. And the allowable value they're giving here is 405, which is, you know, which is considerably less than what we have up here. So um, the big factor here is naturally going to be the spacing. So here, you've come over here and look, here we only have three inches apart. Here we have two inches apart, and then we have inch and a half apart. So it looks like the spacing makes a big difference. So we have spacing here, you know, it's really strong. Spacing here is, you know, is, 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 is better. And then the spacing here is worse. So that seems to be making a big difference as well as, as the uh, length of the fastener. Now, this is confirmed in the report itself where it says faster withdrawal it was the big problem. And there are also some tests that were done at the University of Utah that also confirmed this. So this is how you read these tables. And I would say this table actually gives us more questions than it does answers. And from a seismic retrofit point of view, we need you know, more information than what we have here, as we just saw in some tests that you know, I did on myself. Um, we can go a lot closer with our staples if we want to and not worry about splitting. So I'd like to see some tests where they do uh, you know, maybe one inch uh, on edges and two or three inches in the field with some staples that are two inches long or even two and a half inches long and do some real tests and see what, uh, what would happen if we really tighten up the uh, spacing of the staples. Very similar tests were done at the University of Utah in 2008, and their conclusion was pretty much the same, that the predominant failure mode was staple withdrawal. 
As we just saw, staples can be a very effective way to attach blocking to mud sills as well as build shear walls. However, there's been no testing up to now of either of these uh, approaches. So it is recommended that someone somewhere go ahead and test these blocks that have been attached to mud sills with staples, as well as check and see you know, how shear walls do when the staples are closed as close as one inch or even half an inch on sand. This is recommended because in many seismic retrofit applications, one must attach blocking to the mud sill. And if splitting is no longer consideration, this will help building departments, it will help contractors, it will help designers. Everybody will benefit. The other thing is, as far as the high capacity uh, shear walls go, sometimes we don't have much uh, available foundation on a house, especially at the front where there's a porch and gas meters and that sort of thing. And if we can get a high capacity shear wall made out of staples where we don't have to worry about splitting, it would be a real benefit to the seismic retrofit industry as well as promoting seismic safety all over the country.